One of my favorite things about Star Trek Enterprise is its total reinvention of Star Trek's iconography for the 22nd century. Instead of the 1701, we got the NX-01. Instead of phasers, we got phase pistols. Instead of the transporter, we got the transporting device. Okay, so not that much actually changed, but the show looked different, thanks in no small part to new uniforms by veteran costume designer Robert Blackman. Blackman had designed nearly every Starfleet uniform since Star Trek The Next Generation's third season and turned back the clock for Enterprise, creating costumes meant to evoke NASA's contemporary flight suits and instantly communicating the show status as a prequel to the original series. I'm Paul from Trek Culture. Here are 10 secrets of Enterprise's uniforms that you need to know. Number 10, not gonna hold him down no more. Okay, now that we have the whole obligatory Faith of the Heart reference out of the way, Robert Blackman was Star Trek's chief costume designer since the beginning of TNG's third season. He was responsible for giving the Enterprise D crew their iconic two-piece uniforms, replacing the old back-breaking Lycra spandex jumpsuits from seasons one and two. He was also responsible for Quark's garish Ferengi wardrobe, and made Jerry Ryan pass out from wearing Seven of Nine's silver regeneration suit. Despite all those costumes under his belt, sorry, Blackman was constrained by a handful of strict aesthetic rules for the 24th century, specifically Gene Roddenberry's vision of a future without buttons or zippers. When he was assigned to create the uniforms for Enterprise, though, Blackman was finally free from those restrictions. Like, really free. Differentiating the prequel series' new costumes from their sleek predecessors, Blackman designed Enterprise's 22nd century Starfleet jumpsuits with a whopping 13 zippers and 8 pockets. According to Blackman, some of those pockets weren't even functional. Quote, Those fake pockets can never hold anything. They were a zipper to no pocket, but it was just one of the things I wanted to put in. Number 9. Five-Year Mission Patches when I was a kid in the 90s, yeah, I'm old, all you had to do was tap the left side of your shirt and it was clear to every kid on the playground that you were pretending to beam away to the Enterprise. I mean, was I the only one who did that? I mean, it couldn't have been, right? While the combat should become instantly recognizable as part of Star Trek and even pop culture, Enterprise's 22nd century setting meant the iconic Starfleet Delta was a thing of the past, or future. Either way, the combat was out, and NASA-like mission patches were in. Designed by a scenic artist Wendy Trapanis, the NX-01 mission patch worn on the left side of Enterprise's jumpsuits became the de facto logo for Enterprise, showing up on t-shirts, mouse pads, even Christmas ornaments when the show premiered in 2001. Over the course of Enterprise's four-year run, numerous unique mission patches for various Starfleet ships and stations were featured in the show, including ones for the NX-02 Columbia, the Starship Intrepid, Starfleet Security, Cold Station 12. One patch that was not exactly unique, though, was the patch worn by Lieutenant Mark Luttrell in Season 1's Silent Enemy. In that episode, Luttrell is just straight up wearing a modern-day NASA mission control patch. Let's call it a subtle nod of the show's obvious inspirations. Number 8. Vulcan Vestments Retro-futuristic Starfleet jumpsuits weren't the only major new costumes created for Enterprise. Robert Blackman also designed costumes for Vulcan sub-commander T'Pol. T'Pol's uniform was intended to be more futuristic than her Starfleet crewmates outfits, and also sexy. Describing T'Pol's look, Blackman said, It's a close-fit outfit, certainly, because she's a beautiful woman and it's useful on every level to have some kind of a romantic figure. It is very form-fitting, although it sort of opens up below the knee. It's not the Seven of Nine notion of tight fit, it's more like the Troy or Crusher or Dax notion of close fit. Unlike her fellow Enterprise officers whose costumes were basically covered in pockets, T'Pol's brown, black, and gray streaked stretch knit fabric uniform had no pockets at all. According to Jolene Blaylock in Season 1, T'Pol is just so low maintenance she doesn't need anything else. She's very feline in her movements, so really the cat suit works. Yeah, that, that sentiment would change. Number 7. Starfleet Blues during the pre-production process on Enterprise, the costume department created several prototype uniforms tailored from different materials and dyed different colors. These variants included several shades of blue and even a fully denim Starfleet uniform. The producers eventually settled on a custom dyed navy blue jumpsuit. However, either due to lighting or the dye itself, those navy blue jumpsuits actually ended up looking a lot closer to purple on screen. Eventually new, much more obviously blue uniforms were created for season two, making their first appearance in Minefield. Still. Because Star Trek never wastes anything, background actors can be seen wearing the first season purplish uniforms throughout the course of the series, all the way through to the very last scene in the finale. It's just kind of a shame we never saw the Jean Starfleet jumpsuit. Number 6. Spacesuited and Booted while they had featured in a handful of episodes like the original series The Sullen Web and Voyager's Day of Honor, and movies like The Motion Picture and First Contact, spacesuits are actually a surprisingly rare sight in the whole space-based Star Trek universe. They did, however, fit perfectly into Enterprise's retro-futuristic look. Designed in cooperation between Robert Blackman and Starship designer John Eaves, Enterprise's spacesuits were about as complex as NASA's real-life spacesuits, complete with battery-powered cooling systems, helmet-mounted microphones to record dialogue live, and internal lighting to illuminate the actors' faces. According to Black 
Blackman, Enterprise's spacesuits had all the bells and whistles because they were designed in response to actor complaints about the EV suits worn in First Contact and DS9 and Voyager. Quote, Every time the suits were specified in a script, you could hear the howling across the lot from the actors. Everyone disliked those hot, clunky away suits that were created for the movie Star Trek First Contact, so I went all out enhancing the new copper-colored ones for Enterprise. Number 5. These are the variants. A ton of different Starfleet uniforms have appeared across Enterprise's 98 episodes. Desert attire, cold weather outfits, active wear, admiral's uniforms, even a dress uniform thing. I, I, don't, I don't know, what is Archer actually wearing here? It's like a formal jumpsuit. Other than freshening up the dye job between seasons, no major changes were actually made to Enterprise's standing duty uniforms for the duration of the series. That is, until the series finale, these are the voyages. Set 10 years after the episodes that preceded it, and apparently in Commander Riker's off time on the holodeck, these are the voyages depicted an older, more seasoned Enterprise crew in the final days of their mission. To sell the time jump, the sets were modified and distressed to show age, and Robert Blackman was given the opportunity to revise his Starfleet jumpsuits. These revised uniforms included epaulets on the shoulders, a new Starfleet patch on the right sleeve, and name tags on the left breast. According to Blackman, that last edition was actually a detail he had hoped to include from the very beginning, but was rejected by the producers until the very last episode. Number 4. Starfleet Skivvies whether it's the form-fitting Starfleet jumpsuits or T'Pol's even more form-fitting Vulcan uniform, his clear sex appeal was the driving force behind many behind-the-scenes decisions on Enterprise. I mean, Trip and T'Pol slather each other in lube in literally the first episode of the series, it's not a secret. Anyway, unable to get the cast fully naked on network television, infamous butt shot aside, the producers chose the next best thing hot 22nd century underwear. Unlike most of the clothes seen in Enterprise though, Robert Blackman and the costume department opted not to create Starfleet's underwear from scratch, instead turning to a more terrestrial source, the local mall. The distinctive blue boxer briefs, tank tops, and support bras worn by the Enterprise crew were in fact off-the-shelf DKNY flexline underwear. Apparently the production bought so many packs of these underwear, they had some left over at the end of the series, which were auctioned off in 2008, and we're just gonna go ahead and assume they were unworn. Number 3. Windbreaker Dealbreaker in the decade and a half since the cancellation of Enterprise and the collapse of the United Paramount Network, producers Rick Berman and Brian and Braga have spoken pretty freely about their struggles with the studio. According to Berman and Braga, UPN rushed Enterprise into production over their objections, vetoed plans to set the first season entirely on Earth, and also there was that time network executives tried to force the show to feature a new band each week, like Good Charlotte playing in the mess hall or something. Despite being able to avoid that, there was one change UPN insisted on, no quilted jackets. In his audio commentary for Enterprise Enterprise's pilot episode, Brandon Braga revealed that UPN for some reason hated the quilted look of the away team jackets worn by the crew in Broken Bow and demanded the show never use them again. New, non-quilted windbreakers were commissioned and went on to appear throughout the rest of the series, but the original textured jacket disappeared after two episodes. 2. UPN TNA while Jolene Blaylock publicly praised T'Pol's Vulcan cat suit in Enterprise's first two seasons, her sentiments about the character and her wardrobe seemed to shift by the third year. For season three, the now civilian T'Pol received several new costumes with bright colors, a plunging neckline, and a fit which, according to one media source, quote, hugged Blaylock's supermodel-esque figure. The reason for T'Pol's career change and new costumes was simple, according to Robert Blackman. Quote, the ratings dropped. That's the frank real answer. There wasn't enough Ross sex appeal. Even after T'Pol received a Starfleet commission in the rank of commander early in season four, the costume department opted not to put Blaylock in the standard Starfleet uniform, instead choosing to adapt her civilian attire. This adapted Starfleet uniform included the standard NX-01 mission patch, Commander's rank pips, and Science's blue division trim, while keeping the aforementioned plunging neckline and tight fit. It's unclear exactly why T'Pol wasn't just given a regulation Starfleet uniform, but it probably had something to do with the whole raw sex appeal thing. Regarding T'Pol's costumes and the treatment of her character overall, Jolene Blaylock did not mince words. You can't substitute tits and ass for good storytelling. You can have both, but you can't substitute one for the other because the audience is not stupid. Number 1. Going Where My Heart Will Take Me, The Gym Okay, now we're done with Faith of the Heart gags, but not done with the whole sexy Starfleet uniform thing. According to Robert Blackman, Enterprise's duty uniforms were deliberately designed to show off the actors' physiques and required the cast to dedicate themselves to keeping in shape. Recalling an early discussion with the male cast members, Blackman said, I have to laugh at myself for my hubris. These four actors came in for their first fitting and I said, okay gentlemen, here's the deal. We want to put these very sexy cotton jumpsuits on you. They're not going to have any stretch fabric in them, they won't be skin tight but they'll be very trim, and this concept will only work if you guys commit to staying in the physical shape or getting into better physical shape than you are right now. 
and I'm counting on you to do that. Of course, Linda Park, aka Hoshi Sato, was also required to suit up in Enterprise's very tight attire, and we've already talked about Jolene Blaylock's cat suit twice, but according to Blackman, the cast did succeed in staying in Starfleet uniform shape for the duration of Enterprise. Quote, they did it for four years. All the way back in 2001, not long after his first costume fitting for Enterprise, Scott Bakula had this reaction to a Starfleet uniform. I look like a guy in a uniform. I look pretty darn good. If that's not the most Scott Bakula sounding quote to end on, I don't know what is. So did we miss anything? What uniforms do you want us to unzip next? Let us know in the comments. Like and subscribe and follow us on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can find me on Twitter at Paul Sutherland. Bye.